Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Susanna Doyle, and I am the Alumni Relations Manager at Trinity Development and Alumni. You're all very welcome to this week's Inspiring Ideas at Trinity webinar. We are delighted to have with us guest speakers, Rolly Keating, the CEO of the British Library, who will be in conversation with Helen Shenton, the librarian and college archivist at Trinity College Dublin, where they will be discussing the future of libraries. The talk today is going to last about 30 minutes, followed by about 15 minutes of Q&A with you, our viewers, and we should finish up at about 2 o'clock p.m. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you're viewing on Zoom. And if you're watching on YouTube Live, please input questions in the comments box. The webinar is being recorded for later viewing, so if you're watching on Zoom, you will get the recording after the webinar. And the recording will also be available to view on the TCD alumni YouTube channel after our live broadcast. Now I'd like to hand you over to today's host, my colleague Eileen Punch, the Associate Director at Trinity Development and Alumni, who will introduce our speakers this afternoon. Over to you, Eileen. Thank you, Susanna. And good afternoon, everyone. You're very welcome to the Inspiring Ideas webinar on the future of libraries. My name is Eileen Punch, and I'm an Associate Director at Trinity Development and Alumni where I have the responsibility and the great honor of working with the librarian and her team to support the ambitious plans for the future of Trinity's library. Today, our theme is the future of libraries, and I'm delighted to welcome Rolly Keating and Helen Shenton for a conversation on this topic. We will look forward to questions later and to a discussion with our audience, but firstly, let me introduce our speakers. Rolly, Rolly Keating joined the British Library after a successful career as a programme maker and broadcasting executive at the BBC. He oversaw the launch of the digital channel BBC4 in 2002, before becoming controller of BBC2 and director of archive content. His tenure at the library so far includes the launch of Living Knowledge, a new vision and strategy for the library's growth towards its 50th anniversary in 2023, partnerships with public libraries across the UK, major international projects, the launch of the Knowledge Quarter, which is a partnership of an over 100 knowledge-based organizations around the library's London HQ, the growth of the library's cultural and learning programs, including many high profile exhibitions and an on-site partnership with the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK's National Center for Data Science and AI. You're very welcome today, Rolly. Thank you for joining us. And now to introduce Helen Shenton, who many of you will already know. Helen has been librarian and college archivist in Trinity College Dublin since June 2014. She came to Trinity from Harvard Library, where she was executive director, having previously worked at the British Library, where she led the care of the UK's National Documentary Heritage and National Printed Archive. Prior to that, at the V&A Museum in London, Helen was engaged with the conservation, care and display of the world-renowned Decorative Arts Collection. At Trinity, Helen has led a far-reaching strategy for the library, initiating a year-long public debate on the library of the future. She is program sponsor of two major capital programs, the Old Library Redevelopment Project and the Virtual Trinity Library, which are flagships of the Inspiring Generations philanthropic campaign for Trinity. Helen co-chairs the Task Force on Open Scholarship and advances access to digital resources through UK Electronic Legal Deposit and the Irish e-Library. Thank you both so much for being with us today. And I will now hand over to you for the discussion on the future of libraries. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you so much, and Susanna. Uh, can every, I'm hoping everyone can uh, hear and see us uh, loud and clear. Um, uh, Helen and I are professional colleagues and partners in all sorts of ways. We collaborate on um, uh, the Legal Deposit Library Network, which, which straddles the UK and Ireland. Uh, and we, we talk about professional matters all the time, but it's quite rare that we actually get the chance to talk a little more philosophically uh, about these matters. So I'm really grateful um, for the invitation, uh, Eileen, thank you. And we should have said, by the way, we are going to have a little bit of a conversation and exchange of ideas for about 30 minutes. Um, but after that, we're gonna welcome Eileen back and Eileen, you're gonna share maybe some of the questions um, from all of you uh, and, and welcome and thank you for joining uh, in this, um, this conversation. Um, the topic is indeed the future of libraries, um, which is not a small question. Uh, thank you, Trinity, for raising this, um, uh, this question. And I think we can guarantee up front we will not be doing full justice to that. 
but um, will, I, I hope, at least raise some ideas. And I think it's fair to say that these ideas for both of us, Helen, have been provoked partly by the year we've just been through, which for everyone involved in the sector, obviously in all organisations, has been an enforced period of reflection about purpose and possibility and the constraints uh, and, and thinking about uh, those meanings. So I suspect everything we talk about will be slightly in, in the shadow or under the stimulus of, of um, this global event we're all, um, we're all living through. Um, so Helen, in a, moment, in a moment, actually, I might just ask you to draw out a little bit of Trinity's uh, experience on that. I mean, uh, I think most of you are familiar with, with um, uh, the wonderful library at Trinity College Dublin. Um, for those of you who may not know the British Library so well, um, very, very briefly, we're the, the National Library, of course, of the United Kingdom. We are institutionally younger than most people think, certainly a lot longer, younger than uh, Trinity. We were founded by an Act of Parliament in the early 1970s. Um, but it, of course, that, that very visionary post-war act brought together famously um, much of the, uh, the library collections of the British Museum, hence the very deep heritage collections we hold. Um, but it combined it very, very importantly with many, many other collections and institutions, particularly those with an accent on science and research and national bibliography and data, um, audio collections, the National Sound Archive is with us, um, and many, many other elements. And it was constituted to be a library um, with research at its heart, um, but for everyone, for the whole, for the whole nation. Um, we have sites in London, um, uh, but also crucially in Yorkshire, um, where actually two thirds of the, the collection is held. And a few years ago, we restated our purpose as being to make our intellectual heritage accessible to everyone for research, inspiration and enjoyment. Uh, and that's really been our living knowledge vision structured around some simple statements of purpose around custodianship, research, business and innovation, which is important for us, culture, of course, learning and education and an international role, um, uh, fostering uh, dialogue, and exchanges with partners. And I'm, we're proud to have Trinity as, as one of our partners. And of course, the National Library of Ireland with, um, with Sandra Collins. So look, Helen, let me come to you first on this topic of, um, I suppose, one year on. Um, we, we closed our doors at the British Library, our physical doors, um, on March the 16th in a very, very uncertain and unsettling time. And we didn't know what kind of terrible journey or adventure we were going on. We on our side though, very, very clearly and instantly put the phrase out there on Twitter and the internet and social media, the BL is open. Um, in other words, determined to say that in every possible way we would keep the library open. But perhaps unlike the university sector, we as a national library did have to physically close our doors and thereby depriving people of a great deal of the collection very painfully. And although we've had periods of opening, of course, here in the UK, we are currently in another period of absolute physical closure. Um, and that has undoubtedly done something tough, if you like, to the heart of what we feel our service is, which is that hybrid physical digital um, offer. Um, but it has been a great learning experience and a positive experience in terms of the pivot to digital. We were able to realize the value of some 20 years at least of investment in digitized collections and educational products such as our Discovering Literature website and Discovering Sacred Texts, which we launched. Children's Literature, we were able to launch very successfully during the, um, the pandemic year. Um, and we also discovered, I suppose, the power of what we're doing now that that events in our theatre that might have reached 250 people if it was a full house can now reach twice, four times, 10 times that um, and reach a global audience. So things were lost, but things were gained, I think would be my summary 
and we're still digesting the meaning of that for the future. So I'd be really genuinely interested because we haven't really had a chance to explore this, what it's felt like for you wanting, running one of the world's great university libraries through that. Um, thanks, Rowley. So to your point of saying uh, that um, you say the British Library was open, what we say is the, the library here never closed. So um, on the 12th of March, with five hours notice, we closed all the libraries, um, um, both on the main campus and was also uh, on a hospital campus. And um, I remember that there was this tsunami of, um, of, uh, of borrowing, of all these students came in to borrow. Um, uh, um, um, and then once we closed, they all went down to the, the bar across the, um, uh, the cricket pitch. Um, but substantively, yes, we absolutely closed. Having said that, we pivoted to accelerate the e-access. So that was everything from increasing our electronic resources. It was, as you know, some of the publishers made their content freely available, which was uh, much appreciated. We did everything of virtual consultations. So our subject librarians, you know, would have virtual consultations. We then did, we supported um, all the teaching flipped to online. So we had to support all of that, um, uh, which we did. We supported everyone through assessments, which virtually all flipped to online. And then as the academic year um, uh, started, we then um, did all of our inductions. Normally we have, you know, we show thousands of, of people about how to use the library and do um, uh, courses in research methodology or, um, and so on. So we flipped all of that. At the same time, um, it became, we were actually only closed, the physically closed, I worked it out was for three months. And right from the beginning, it was, how do we open? How do we reopen? And I would say that the library was in the vanguard of the reopening of the university. And um, it was at the end of June that we then opened one space and of course, we had to completely reconfigure the libraries because of social distancing of two meters. So instead of having three and a half thousand spaces, we were down to less than 20%. Plus you had to move everything around. The, I would say all the mitigating measures, the health and safety measures we put in were phenomenal. I can remember the bill for 30,000 euro of hand gel coming in, um, you know, and all the screens, but it was the working practices. We, um, staff worked in pods when we started to come back, so they kept in groups and so on. So all that had to be figured out. And also, um, we uh, then gradually, we open, in July, we opened most of the contemporary libraries. But before that, we put in place all these other services. So we became Argos, click and collect. So you could, <laughs> you could order a book and come and pick it up. Well, that was all done from scratch. And as you know, you would usually, usually take a year or two to think that through. And we did it so quickly. Um, scan on demand. You want something scanned? We will scan it for you. Um, one issue was we had thousands of books out. And it wasn't just we had thousands of books out around the world. If the fourth years went to, in order to graduate, they have to have no books out. Now, we extended all the loan periods and we got rid of all the fines. But we had to get the books back. So um, all the Irish universities came to an agreement with Anpost, which is the mail service, to post out pre prepaid envelopes. Thousands of books come back. Then we use the same thing to send books out. So you can order a book and we will send it out to you through the, through the mail service. But, and we set up live chat. Um, so we set up all the booking systems because then, because of the health and safety, you can only... Um, have one hour 45 minutes in a space before you have to move. So all this, we did not have a booking system. We did not have a, and so all that, we started off with Eventbrite. All that had to be done from scratch very quickly and all credit to colleagues. I mean, it was incredible what we did. Um, but what was really important was that as soon as, we didn't even have a system. When we opened, we have 50 spaces. How do you prioritize who has those 50 spaces? We prioritize the postgrads. We had no mechanism of ask, how did you prioritize? So we wrote to them all and said, if you have, make a case. And 50, it was actually, we did, uh, the, 
uh, hundreds wrote in, but we had these searing testimonials of the circumstances that people were living in. And on the first day that we reopened at the end of June, one of the postgrads wrote, I got more work done in two hours than in two months at home. They were in this maelstrom of anxiety, let alone the personal circumstances. And that started to hammer home the importance and people were using and have since used the phrase of sanctuary, oasis, because it's calm, it's safe, it's got very good connectivity. You know, we don't have broadband right across the country um, or very good broadband right across the country. So this sanctuary was really important. And then what was even more important, I realized we had a, a, a searing um, uh, a presentation by the directors of um, counseling services and um, the health service. And the, um, the, the mental well being of students or the, the poor mental well being, it just rocketed. You know, it's the same in society. But we had this presentation. And what became clear to me from that, the libraries were actually a non medical support. Because students, they were getting so isolated, they, um, um, they, they weren't even having eye contact with anyone and were being encouraged to come into the library just to have contact. So we were a non-medical support. Um, I think we've lost Roly, so I'll just keep talking till he comes back. <laughs> Hello, Roly. Um, so it's um, um, that element, so that, Two things have emerged. One is the importance of the E, and we've accelerated the um, uh, access to, to an online library. To your point, we never close, or we're open. But then the importance of the physicality and of the space. And um, to me, that is riding the zeitgeist of two different things of, of COVID. One, societally, everyone is flipped online and digital is so important. And the other is then the physical, the experiential um, is even more important than this um, and so on. The anti-isolation and, and, uh, and, and so on. I think so both of those have come out loud and clear. Really interesting. Um, and I'm sorry if I disappeared. I think you disappeared on me. We had a moment okay. of technical, hey, that's the modern, that's the world we're in. Re so much that stimulates me listening to that, Helen, yes, I mean, we, on on um, on the the prioritization side, it's the last thing libraries want to do is rank our users. But we had to do something similar with our um, remote access service, British Library on Demand, uh, which we did manage to keep going with scanning all the way through, but with the priority, of course, on medical and scientific research in the middle of a, a pandemic. Um, when we did finally reopen for a period, a long period, a couple of periods in the autumn, very like you, we had limited hours, limited booking, um, and the gratitude and sense of rediscovery and intensity was palpable and really taught us lessons when we think about the future of libraries, that wonderful as the digital is, um, you do need that. It's not just physical collection access. And by the way, we cannot lend, of course. You, you as a, uh, you can lend to your student community, but you can lend um, for a national library like ours. It really is, with the, with the exception of the remote access digital service, it's an on-site service. So I'm uh, um, fascinated by your Argos aspect that, that 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 adds another whole layer. But tell me a little bit more about your digital yep. pivot um, because I've seen a, a, a greatly admired virtual Trinity, which I don't think was there in that form a year ago. So, so what, um, uh, what did that mean for you and what did that teach you about uh, the future? Thank you. So um, this is something that had been in the works for two or three years. And again, mm. we accept, we just accelerated it. And mm. so this is our virtual Trinity library. Um, the, uh, the ambition, is we've got, um, as you know, a stellar historic collections, unique and distinct collections. And over time, we want to make all of it available to anyone around the world or anyone, well, 
anyone with access to the internet and, and, um, and electricity. Um, and so it's a, it's a long-term multi-year, very ambitious program to not, in fact, not just to digitize all of our unique and distinct collections, which is 850 medieval manuscripts and 800,000 maps and you know, Beckett manuscripts and so on. Um, but also there's a whole sort of, the, the, the vision is to conserve them, conserve the material, catalog it. Oftentimes, as you know, um, everything isn't cataloged with new metadata, curate it, digitize it, but also introduce advanced technology. So maybe automated transcriptions, automated translations, hyperspectral imaging, that sort of thing. Um, and then we're also working closely with um, uh, the Academy to do primary research and then disseminate. So the simple thing is it'll be on the web, but also there's, um, there's blog posts. And as we go through this, um, we will disseminate these projects. And what we did was we looked at, this is, as you know, really tricky to decide how, what's your priority. So we looked at all of our unique and distinct collections and put them into sort of nine categories, things like um, Ireland's literary heritage. So that could be Beckett or um, uh, Brendan Connelly or, or so on. Um, it, we looked at, it could be European heritage. So we've got an amazing um, hidden collection called Fargal, which is um, was, was um, as an amazing pan-European uh, uh, collection that was um, uh, um, uh, has been uh, 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 collected since um, it, it traces a, a, a family in the Netherlands, a high-ranking family in the Netherlands. They're collecting through several centuries all the medieval manuscripts. So we put or, or world heritage. We've got Egyptian papyri, you know, books of the dead that are uh, meters long. So we put them into these different categories and then underneath each of those is, is, is a collection. Um, and then that has been one of our, the flagship projects under the Inspiring Generations, which is our capital campaign for the whole of the university. And this was absolutely the rocket boost. Um, as I say, it had been in the works for a while, um, but we launched it a couple of weeks ago because we had um, uh, we got funding from the Carnegie Corporation of New York to start the um, uh, the medieval manuscripts. We've got funding from the Dutch government, working with the National Library in the Netherlands to start the Fargal collection and so on. And that is absolutely, again, right, riding the zeitgeist, that we were already going to do it in this world. It's even more important. I also think there's elements around virtual reconstruction is even more important. And we're having a big debate at Trinity at the moment. There's a provostial election on um, as how do we have a really sustainable campus? And the idea has come out that actually, when you do digitization, and particularly if you um, uh, collaborate on uh, parts of different collections, that that can offset travel, which could be part of our sustainability uh, agenda and so on. So that is, that is one of our two major, major uh, flagship programs. Um, and this has absolutely been the rocket boost for it. How fantastic. And, and I take it, it's been, it's been a success already. Have people discovered it and, and come to it? Oh, yes, absolutely. And, and it's embedded in our, in our, in our um, courses. So there's a, an MPhil that has been on medieval history, cross-disciplinary, that is predicated um, on some of the manuscripts, the first 16 manuscripts that we're going to digitize. Really interesting. I mean, we've, I, I think maybe 20 years ago, and thank God, the libraries did the process of digitization mass digitization yes. began and that's that's the foundation the bedrock of all of this particularly for these heritage collections yes. it's harder for, for copyright era yes. material of course um but i think the great lesson of the last five ten years is that that's necessary but not remotely enough um you've talked about curatorship and having to bring narrative clustering yes. interpretive curatorship to make meaning of these resources and it's what uh, in all sorts of ways our learning teams do for instance at the British Library with the discovering uh, series which has really made really academically challenging material accessible to young students teenagers and very very successfully uh, around the world but also I think Eileen mentioned our partnership with um, the Alan Turing Institute yeah. for, for data science and we're working on a project with them called living with machines which is 
taking something you know all about our newspaper uh, digitization um digitized historic newspapers from the 19th century and other materials yeah. maps and trying to apply the affordances of big data analytics artificial intelligence pattern recognition to survey that material at a scale human beings simply can't um uh in order to extract patterns and and learnings and, and new knowledge um from the historical record in this sense to for instance we to, to try and identify every instance of an accident ref referred to in a newspaper on an industrial site no human being could do that across millions of, of pages so that's hugely exciting and i feel this last year has moved that center stage but there is that paradox and you've alluded to which is that the the power of the physical space and the physical experience as if anything emotionally at least grown and we don't know what it's going to do for real visitor numbers and you must be the same i mean tourism and sort of people congregating on mass feels a, a challenging thing at the moment but we've certainly alongside this work been developing some of our big capital projects both to it, expand our London buildings and to really, really create, we hope, a major new space uh, in the north of England, in Leeds, alongside a revived Boston Spa. And are you doing the same? Are you reinvesting in the physical at the same time as the digital? Absolutely. So um, in parallel, <laughs> we've also mm. been advancing the other major capital project under the Inspiring Generations, which is an extremely ambitious, complex, an utterly necessary um, redevelopment of the old library. Mm. So, the, so the old library, which I contest the long room, is the most recognized interior in Ireland, Falsher Island, the a tourism island, they use it abroad. We had the Taoiseach, the, the prime minister in just before um, in, in December, and he was in the long room. You know it is this glorious cathedral. It's beautiful. I miss it like anything. Um, and there was the Brian Baru Harp. It is the home to the very symbol of Ireland. You know, the emblem of, of Ireland is taken from the Brian Baru Harp, uh, which is in the long room and flip it. And that's Guinness. But, you know, but there was the T-shirt by the Brian Baru Harp. And I said, I contest that this is the most recognized interior in Ireland and he, I, he agreed. Um, so it is more, so it is um, uh, an extremely important historic monument. It is a protected monument. Um, it, um, there is a major program on. The main driver is the conservation of the building and the conservation of the collection. So the 750,000 volumes within. Um, and so uh, we have to do environmental control, uh, fire suppress, fire pre prevention, fire suppression, and so on. That's the major driver. Then we also, we're taking the opportunity to reimagine what's in this fabulous collection uh, building. And we're going to create a research collection study center on the ground floor as half of that um, um, uh, uh, phenomenal building. It'll be so inspirational. It'll be almost as, as inspirational as the 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 the, uh, the reading rooms of the British Library. It'll look out over the square, um, one of the squares. Um, there's also the uh, there'll be environmental control and so on. It'll be aesthetically absolutely delightful. There will also be um, a seminar room because we we have reinvented our um, uh, curriculum recently. And as part of that, being a research inspired university, every student has to now, undergrad, has to do a research project. I say, we are sitting in the library on a gold mine of research projects. I want to give access to primary, unique and distinct material, but you have to do it safely and so on. So within that, there'll be a seminar room. Then we're also completely refreshing the uh, Book of Kells exhibition. Um, putting it much more into a global context, making it more interactive and so on, improving the visitor facilities. And then there will also be a rotating display, which is to showcase some of our other material, but also it can uh, showcase research of our cohort of students. It can be a landing place for traveling exhibitions. We can work with science gallery and the, the two um, we, uh, on, uh, on campus, which has this wonderful 
byline of where art and science collide. And so we've got this axis across campus of the Science Gallery, then we've got the um, Douglas Hyde Gallery, you know, there's things that we can do together. So anyway, but the point is, when we um, have conserved the long room, it'll look even more of itself. Because we're just getting rid of, you know, we're, we're conserving it, basically, uh, which is very urgent. But that sensory experience. So when visitors come in, they take in the arc. And they go. Um, they drop their voice, take out the phone, take a pho photograph, but it's so sensory and experiential. And this physical experience, I mean, I know shopping centers are wondering, retail, how can we make experiences um, when, when all the shops re reopen? And here we are with this fabulous sensory experience. Uh, many people comment on the smell, which is this, particularly young people, they've never smelled um, fur for all or vol vol <laughs> volatile organic compounds, as you know, which is actually the deterioration of the of the broken paper, as you know, which is why we need to put the environmental control in that. But so it's actually it's really, really sensory. And we don't want to change that at all. We just want to make it more of itself. And I think that is the other side of the paradox is that people are so desperate for sensory things. And, and so that has, again, accelerated what we're doing. That's amazing. Um, uh, yes, we did some research into the smell of historic <laughs> books a few years yes. ago. So yep. I, 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 I completely understand that. <laughs> Let, before we come to the q and I just want to raise, move, move us outwards yeah. a little bit. Um, uh, 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 one theme is here around the, con what, the very particular role of libraries as we think about the wider society yeah. around us. And on an immediate level, there's this notion perhaps of a kind of convening power yeah. that I think libraries can have. Uh, Eileen mentioned something that we, we've embarked on about six or seven years ago called the Knowledge Quarter here in, in our London site, actually, where... Um, we, we've found a way to bring together a hugely diverse set of companies, institutions, organizations, all united around some contribution to advancing knowledge in some way. Um, but I think we were able to do that partly through geography, but partly because a library is both big, but also neutral, so unthreatening. Yeah. It's not a competitive yeah. entity or, or brand. And I think that for us, that that was a very educational, but also felt very precious. We realized how vital that that element of trust that libraries have is, particularly at a time of, of mistrust. And I just wonder whether that chimes that chimes with you and perhaps tells us something about the role of, of libraries as society evolves over what's going to be a very challenging decade ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it was it's so. Uh, impressive what you've done at putting, you know, the, the, the British Library at the centre of the Knowledge Quarter, which could be anything from Google to uh, yeah. secondary school. They're all yeah. knowledge creators. Um, and in fact, when I was at the British Library, we had the idea was a square mile as opposed to mm. the Knowledge Quarter. And that was partly we figured out there were more libraries in that square mile than anywhere in the world. And also it was to mirror the square mile of the city, which is the engine of the economy. And the idea was then this was an engineer engine, engine of, of knowledge. So the, I think there's, there's, there's two points. Firstly, the neutrality and the trust, particularly in uh, this era of fakeness and fake news and everything, who can you trust? And, the um, uh, libraries are known, I mean, you know, there's been all this work done, but they are absolutely one of those, the most trusted uh, sources of information. Um, but the convening power, so Trinity um, is going to have a second campus down on what used to be called Silicon Docks. And that is, <laughs> uh, which again, it's, it's one of those campuses which is, um, small with a, uh, with a nucleus, it's like it's happening at um, uh, Stratford, what's that called now, Here East, the Olympic Park, 
Yeah. Yes, yeah. Hear East is one of the 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 um, the, the um, sites in London's Olympic Park, which yeah. is where the VNA is going to have its archive. That's centre. right, and where and University College London is there. That's right. They'll be there by the river. Yeah, that's with, it. With the, with the robotics, so there's a there's a vision. It's now um, just being called Trinity East, um, mm -hmm. and I feel very strongly that you know uh, there's there's been lots of discussion, and there's there needs to be um, a, a nucleus. And I don't care personally whether you call it a library or not, but you know, a place where people come, and we found this during lockdown that people needed a space. Um, and that, to your uh, uh, word, the convening power of, of the library to be a center, to be a, a honeypot. Um, you can have, you know, um, a, a coffee shops, seminars, whatever. There's a blurring of boundaries. But I think it's really, really powerful. And I can see that um, as part of the, the Trinity East. That's wonderful. Well, look, I might come, before we do Queen, I might come back to you one more time, just for some final thoughts building on that around whether between us we can begin to contribute to debate about how you define the, the distinct contribution of the library in this extraordinary years that lie ahead, partly conditioned by, by need for public understanding of science which we've seen in this last year and how you blend knowledge to ensure that you factor in history culture humanity um, to solve problems for the world and, and build a healthy economy but also I, i'm struck that i mean you mentioned misinformation and the perhaps we might say the dark side of digital and i love digital technology and it's been a lifesaver and a connector but we've all seen um what can happen when certain aspects of it uh, are really let loose in the world and and libraries can't libraries have to be respectful of the role we can play but i think there's a we've talked a lot about the values that libraries can inject yeah. into the the ecosystem of knowledge and, and information and it and it's a i sometimes think of it as a kind of respect and humility in the face of knowledge. We're not there to always provide the answers ourselves, but to enable others to facilitate the authentic uh, and trustworthy acquisition of knowledge, to raise the literacy and information capabilities of everyone, your students are our users, so that they can grow knowledge, they can make those discoveries and learn from each other. And that's increasingly precious, it seems to me, when we're all being bombarded with pseudo answers and, yeah. and, and quick fix uh, fix ideas. So I just wonder if that those thoughts influence your thinking as you think about the future of your institution. Absolutely, because you can't, we can't um, uh, impose on people, but you know, I was thinking about it. Um, Vartan Gagorian, when he, um, um, he was in conversation for this launch and he had the most amazing phrases about libraries, about them being, um, world um, librarians being world humanitarians, mm -hmm. you know, and these, um, and um, I don't know someone recently talked about them being the peon of civilization. And, and if, you if you get it down to its essence, I do think libraries are one of the high points of civilization because what do we essentially do? We gather all this information, we curate it, and then we say, go, here you are, free use it as you like um, to educate, to inspire or whatever, but it's how people use it, but it's the basic, uh, um, um, the, um, uh, the authenticity and, the, and the, um, the integrity of what we are giving for others to use. You know, we are, we are not doing it for you, but you can trust what the values, you can trust what it is that we are giving you. Um, it's a trusted source, I suppose. Um, I think that's absolutely what's at the, uh, it's absolutely fundamental to what libraries do and even more so. It's even more important. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Well, look, on that rousing note, Helen, that's really <laughs> inspiring. Shall we um, uh, maybe turn to Eileen and say, I, I've not been following chat bar or Q&A, so Eileen, we're in your hands. Are, are, are there questions that you or, or others would like to... Uh, yeah. Uh, ask of us in the remaining 20 minutes or so. Plenty of questions coming in. Um, so I think we're going to need a bigger webinar um, <laughs> to explore all the 
avenues of discussion you've opened up and you've touched on many of the points, but some of the key themes coming through are about, um, well, fake news, um, uh, the library as a source of, um, I, actually, I'll just mention a couple of the, and you might want to go back into the conversation mode rather than do them because there's a big themes coming through here. Okay. So the libraries as a bulwark against misinformation and uh, trusted space, which you've touched on um, against the, uh, a world of fake news. Um, the idea of, new platforms, open access, um, what, how, how, will, how will the libraries fund the um, rapid expansion of digital services in these fields at, 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 at the different levels? Um, and the funding comes through in a few cases because at, the, mm. at, at every level, apparently the sharper cuts are affecting libraries at every level, both in the communities and universities at every level. So how can, how can, you, how can libraries be innovative in this space? What can they do? What alliances they might need to make um, then, in a, and again, this was touched on in an information saturated world, um, the libraries versus other sources of information. Um, again, where is the, what is the unique position? And again, well, um, you know, the, 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 the trusted role coming into play here. Um, and a, an interesting one that maybe you might deal with at the end, what is the disinfecting process for cleaning books and documents that come in and quarantine for books? <laughs> So I think those are the, the, the principal themes coming coming in, but I, um, perhaps I might leave that with you to either comment to get built. Both of you might like to comment or one of you might cover or the other, if that's OK. And then I can come back in because the questions are piling in. Oh, so, gosh, there were, well, three, three fascinating themes there. We'll, we'll come to disinfectant towards, <laughs> towards <laughs> the end. He Helen, I, I'm not sure what brand of disinfectant we use, <laughs> so I'm going to have to hand to you probably for, for that one. But I mean, in all seriousness, it's a very, it's a deeply serious and, and troubling and difficult question. Uh, and um, uh, we've been working on a 72 hour period of quarantine effectively for, for books. Um, but this but it's living science, this, because we've never lived through this particular pandemic before. I think we've all had to, uh, to learn. Um, so Helen, do, do come in towards the end if you have on that. But sh shall we though, since we're, we're in that territory, pick up on those, I mean, I, I'm hearing, I think two or three big themes coming out of that and, and, and I'd be interested, Helen, in your views. Um, uh, one is around openness and open access. And um, let, let me give a few reflections and then, then hand to you. So first of all, on the open, the openness question, when we published Living Knowledge, we made a commitment to openness at the heart of that. And it was about not just, as it were, what in academic publishing is called open access, which is a, a very specific term and is an important movement and progression, certainly in the UK, um, academic scene, which we, can, we can't we can drive exactly, but we can support and, and help to enable. Um, uh, but then there's also something about institutional openness and changing ourselves in the way we work. And I think we've, we've endeavored to become more transparent, more open in, in the way we work. And then there's simply opening up every bit of the collection that we can in new ways through um, uh, through digital and through other means, opening ourselves to new to new audiences. Um, that relates to funding, and I think uh, that's an extremely live question. And uh, clearly, in all parts of the world, um, libraries, are, uh, different nations, are tackling the issue of how you fund good, consistent library services in different ways. Every university has to make this judgment. Every nation has to make it in terms of the funding of a national library itself, but then very, very particularly the wider network of public libraries, which of course are certainly in the UK are very much a function of local authority funding as well. So we're we're grappling with those, and I would I suppose I would say we're we're both as the national library trying to use such scale and impact and momentum and confidence that we have to where we can network and support the wider sector. We can't literally grant funding, uh, but we are working with public libraries in now, for instance, in ways that we've never worked before uh, through something we call the Living Knowledge Network, which is growing and very, very successful, um, which means we can share exhibitions and amplify uh, the work we do or share live events in, in new ways. 
Um, and then I think there's also and something, this might be my segue to hand to Helen. I think uh, in a way, all nations, all institutions will make funding judgments on their understanding of the fundamental role that the potential locus of investment delivers. And I think part of that is making the case, making the advocacy, really expressing the meaning and if you like sort of value generative role of libraries ever more strongly. Uh, and we do this very directly in a UK context through the work we, we do with public library partners to support business and enterprise, where we have been able to make really powerful quantified uh, evidence sets for central government about when you unlock the power of libraries to help people come up with new ideas that can be translated into businesses, for instance, and new kinds of innovation, that generates jobs, that generates lo supports local economies, and it does it through the business ownership of people who might reject or feel alienated from conventional business services, but because it's rooted through a library, it is unthreatening, it is safe, as Helen put it, it's unthreatening, it's welcoming, which is why so many of the business owners we've supported perhaps are women or from minority ethnic uh, backgrounds, we're very proud of that. So I think there's that, the case making um, that big libraries like ours can do is part of it, um, but it's not the whole answer. Helen, so I'm going to ask you to answer the difficult part. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Molly. Um, so, um, funding, yes. Um, so the, the, the situation in Ireland is um, the, um, we can see which way the economy is going. You know, um, uh, just look at the deficit, look at the deficit. And um, Trinity is a public organization, um, but less, even now, less than 40% of our funding is straight from government. So we are a government organization, we're a public organization, but less than 40% of the 300 million plus that is the um, Trinity is from government. So um, we've already diversified the funding. And so if I look on the local level of the library, we've already diversified and we need to diversify more. So philanthropy, absolutely. You know, we're, um, we're, we're part of the capital campaign. We've been starting for five years, both the old library redevelopment project and the virtual Trinity library are coming out of that campaign foundations, individuals, governments, and so on. Then we, um, we also um, research funding. So I would like, I think it's wonderful what the BL uh, British Library did with the Alan Turing Institute of you know, big data. Um, I actually talk about big content, but uh, big data. Um, but that sort of partnering, uh, there's an ADAPT, a uh, fantastic um, um, uh, computer science based um, uh, institute um, uh, or, um, uh, group at, at Trinity that we've worked with a little bit. I'd like to do much more of that. So capitalizing on the research and what we've got, and then obviously um, a lot of EU funding um, is, is where we'd, we'd look for that. Um, government. Now government, I think, I'm a huge believer in the soft power of cultural diplomacy. Huge believer. Somebody said to me, oh, well, soft power is no power. But I do think that the soft power of cultural diplomacy is extremely Im important. And to your point about advocacy and influencing, and I would say in two ways, the specific for uh, Trinity, when any visiting head of state, any visiting global leader, at the, um, uh, we're very happy to help the Department of the Taoiseach, the Department of Foreign Affairs, they come to the old library. They come to the long room. I've hosted Joe Biden twice, you know, and delighted to be so, you know, because it is a national monument. It's a national treasure that just happens to be in Trinity. And so, you know, on behalf, we've called it, in fact, Eileen coined the phrase, the nation's front room. So it's the nation's front room and that, that cultural diplomacy. Um, so when Ireland was, um, uh, 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 campaigning for a, a seat at the uh, UN Security Council, we were delighted to host, you know, all the um, the UN uh, uh, delegates when they came over. So there's that element of 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 of, of um, cultural diplomacy, and 
um, the influencing element. Then there's the hard cash. And I think we're doing things like contingent valuation, um, willingness to pay, all those um, economic um, uh, mechanisms of showing the value, the, the dollar value of the cultural institutions. And so there's, um, I think, an, an awful lot to show the impact, the straightforward economic impact. So we're doing um, uh, economic impact uh, assessment around the old library, um, you know, how much are people willing to pay um, for um, uh, 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 access to the collections? We're not going to charge them access, to, but it's, it's how much. Then there's the flip side of how much do you contribute to island PLC? And for example, the old library, um, it's the, uh, the, when it's open, um, the, um, is the second only to Guinness storehouse as a destination. For visitors. Now, I think you know that is all that funding goes directly to the acad academic enterprise that pays for forty professors. It pays for ninety PhDs directly. But all, and I also think it's fantastic that so many people come to see a medieval manuscript. Uh, <laughs> must be is incredible. But that, um, that also, it isn't just that that contributes to, to Trinity because we're less than 40% from government. But that brings in, we estimated, I can't, it's something like, it's either 6 million or 9 million a year to, to Island PLC in terms of the uh, of visitors and so on. So I think we need to be more um, upfront about these, the, the, the hard cultural uh, uh, value and, and what we bring, as well as then the softer. And I also think we need much more influencing I'm working a little bit with government at the moment on various fronts, and it's that influencing, um, and not just this sector, um, across the public, the public library sector is fantastic in Ireland. Um, I think of Dublin actually as a city of libraries. We've got Marsh's Library, we've got Chester Beatty, the National Library, we've got us, we've got Molly, which is the Museum of the Literature of Ireland. Um, Fantastic. And it was the public libraries who championed um, Dublin becoming a UNESCO city of literature. You know, this, the, the, the potential for collaboration, um, I think, is huge. Coming back to your knowledge quarter, that, that convening power, um, I, I think there's huge potential for us um, on those fronts. It's wonderful to hear. Thank you. Okay. I, Eileen, we didn't quite do the, justice to the question about... Um, information saturated world but uh, we could maybe come back to that at the end can i just come in a couple more questions in the short time okay. we have so perhaps brief comments and then we'll wrap up um just a question about copyright and the implications for copyright as libraries move into the online world and also a question about um should libraries have um, an active disposal policy as well as an acquisitions policy that is it is the is the core, the principle of keeping everything forever still, or is there something more, uh, another model that libraries should be considering um, in, 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 in that space? And the final question, which we then will definitely leave it in, are you both building a COVID archive? A what a COVID, archive? A COVID, COVID archive. We're living in the, the, the future of our present. <laughs> So Perhaps COVID very archive, briefly, yeah. we'll oh, five minutes okay. left. You might comment briefly on those, and then, then we'll wrap up. Well, look, I'll, I'll let um, uh, Helen have the final word. Let me let me try and do very very swift uh, swift responses. Uh, first of all, three very good questions from uh, from me. Um, from a national library perspective, disposals are vanishingly rare, really, uh, if at all, because we are in a, we are. The whole power of what we are doing through legal deposit and other kinds of acquisition is a constantly growing record and we're very proud of that and that's our, our promise to pros pos uh, posterity so it's it's not um it's not generally comfortable to think about uh, removing things ever from from the record uh, there may be if they're not captured by legislation the old duplicate or something that, that occasionally appears but very very rare um but that may be different, of course, quite properly for other kinds of libraries. So we have a very particular uh, recording role there. Um, oddly enough, that relates, I think, to the question around COVID 
collecting. And yes, indeed, one of the very earliest moves that we made, and I'm sure there's an exact equivalent uh, in Ireland as well, was to recognize we are living through um, uh, a historic era and we need to double, uh, double our collecting. But for instance, in the online space, uh, Helen and I are both involved in um, the, the UK Web Archive project and, and we've been collecting in depth to ensure that we, we don't just skim the surface of the web, but we really try and preserve websites which are changing on a daily basis relevant to the, um, the COVID crisis here and big oral history projects to working with the health service and lots and lots of other materials in partnership with archives across the UK. Um, and that probably leaves me with insufficient time to tackle copyright, except to say it's a superb question. Copyright has already evolved and reformed somewhat in response to the digital age, but I think it will be a pattern of our lifetime as we learn what digital is to continue to advocate here and there for certain parts of reform while protecting the, the publishing and, and rights holding industry. Helen, to you. Uh, thank you. So I'll just say ditto for my response to copyright <laughs> in the interest of time. Um, then in terms of um, disposal policy, so we are a UK copyright library and an Irish copyright library. So those we cannot dispose of those. Um, and that's about 75% of our collections. So that one, it, it legally, um, you know, we are, we are holding it on behalf of uh, UK copyright. We are holding on behalf of the island of Ireland. Um, the, for our historic collections, um, the, again, those are almost last resort um, uh, collections. And um, it's a slippery slope. I know this comes up, you know, why don't you sell this one manuscript to um, you know, pay for this, that and the other. It's a, a slippery slope in many ways. Um, a lot of donate donations, you know, all of our collections are all based on major donations um, and um, donors expect them to be held in perpetuity. Um, and so there's a lot around that. In terms of um, multiple copies of textbooks, all universities do dispose of them. We have a very, very, very thoughtful process about that. We've looked into um, how can we do this um, to help maybe the global south um, or how can we use this for charity um, and so we have a, we do have a policy on that it's not a lot of it's not a lot uh, uh, it's not a large volume um, but it's very thoughtful about how do we dispose you know you've got 25 copies of a textbook that's now out of date no we don't need all 25 copies which brings me on then to our collecting rather than collecting acquisitions collection development which is what building the COVID um, archive is. So yes, on day one, we set up uh, living in lockdown, uh, which was a rapid response collecting the now. Um, and we put out a call to all Trinity community um, to capture it. And so that started off with photographs of empty campuses. Um, and then we've just actually um, last week, oh, on the anniversary, so on the 12th, um, We've um, just put up a lot of uh, uh, school children's responses to uh, lovely poems and, uh, and so on. And I, in fact, in terms of collection development, we should be doing more and more and more of that. And my final point on collecting the now, as Rowley says, we, um, we both work on the web archiving. There is not legislation for archiving the .ie web domain. It drives me crazy. I am in advocacy campaign mode. It, it's all there. We just need to do it. Most of the countries in Europe, plus, U uh, plus the UK, sorry, Rowley, um, <laughs> have got it. We should have it. Uh, on that point, I will finish. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you very much, Helen. That sounds like a good note to end on. And we will all look forward to visiting um, nostalgically the COVID archive from the distance of history <laughs> that we hope will be soon. Uh, but just thank you very much for fascinating. We could have spent the whole afternoon and you've presented not just the issues for our present of libraries, but the future of libraries, um, and also the, the enduring issues that are brought to a point of magnification now in, in these COVID times. So thank you both very much, and we will continue the conversation. And thanks to everyone who joined us today, our Trinity alumni and our friends. And just to say a big thank you, because our Trinity alumni have supported the library, Trinity's library, so generously through the decades, and you have helped us 
save our treasures and safeguard our future, and we are enormously indebted to you. So we hope we'll reconvene in live format and we'll have an opportunity to welcome you back to the actual real physical library before too long. But in the meantime, I'll hand back to Susanna to wrap things up for today. Thank you. Thank you so much to, to all of you for such an incredibly um, engaging, interesting discussion. Um, as for everybody else listening in, I can't wait as well to, to get back uh, into the library as well. Um, thanks to Roly, to Helen, to Eileen. Um, thank you as well to our Trinity um, Development and Alumni staff who have been working behind the scenes, in particular Alex Owens and Anna O'Loughlin to help make this webinar happen. And again, thanks to all of you for listening in and participating and asking so many interesting questions. If you'd like more information about uh, the British Library, the library campaign here at Trinity, um, the URLs are there at the bottom of your screen. If you have other questions about this webinar series or have anything else you'd like to ask to Trinity Development and Alumni, please email us at alumni at tcd.ie. Our next webinar in the Inspiring Ideas series will be in two weeks time on the 7th of April when Professor Patrick Prendergast will share a retrospective on his 10 year provostship, which ends in July. The registration link for the upcoming webinar will be sent out via email next week. So please keep an eye on your inboxes. And I also just wanted to bring your attention to uh, another webinar series, um, Future Cities, where we will have our second series in the webinar next week with a focus on New York. There will be an email going out today um, and you can also find more information about the Future Cities webinar series online um, on our website tcd.ie in the news and ev events section, Future Cities webinars. Again, thank you so much for participating today. We hope to see you again soon. In the meantime, please stay safe. Thank you. <laughs>